Hey, everybody. This week, we are focusing on revolutions in the Atlantic. We'll be looking at some wars in Europe, but our major focuses will be the War for Independence, aka the American Revolution, followed by the French Revolution, followed by the Haitian Revolution. So let's dive right in. The European Wars. Rivalry among the European powers intensified in the 1600s, specifically the early 1600s, when the Dutch attacked Spanish and Portuguese possessions in the Americas and then in Asia. In the 1600s and 1700s, the British then checked Dutch commercial and colonial ambitions and went on to defeat France in the Seven Years' War which was from 1756 to 1763, and take over French colonial possessions in the Americas and in India. Obviously, Britain is a tough opponent. They take what they want. But what will happen next? The American Revolution. The unprecedented cost of the war to the 17th and 18th centuries drove European governments to seek new sources of revenue at a time when the intellectual environment of the Enlightenment inspired people to begin questioning and protesting all state attempts to introduce new ways of collecting revenue. And these wars were very, very costly. When Britain went to war against the Dutch, when they're involved in the Seven Years' War and the French and Indian War, that takes a, a very steep financial toll. These European wars, you've got the War of Spanish Succession, and in this case, you have a French duke who is third in line to the throne of France is given the Spanish throne. And Europe goes to war over this because there are serious concerns that once this French duke has the throne of Spain, he'll also inherit the throne of France. Can't have that. So the only way that this was resolved was the French throne and ownership of the Netherlands had to be given away. So the French Duke could actually go and rule Spain. The wars of Austrian succession from 1740 to 1748. The war between Britain and Spain and Spain over smuggling brought it into quite the European conflict. Uh, Maria Theresa, you might know her. Um, she is the mother of Marie Antoinette. And she became she becomes the first empress in her own right. She rules the Austrian Empire. Her husband is Francis of Lorraine. And he, when he takes the crown or he becomes the emperor, he really doesn't actually rule. It's only Maria Theresa. She is a strong, strong-willed woman, and it was her way or the highway. As she had right to be, she's the first empress in her own right. That's pretty awesome. Um, the Seven Years' War involved Britain and France over North American territory. In the Americas, it's called the French and Indian War, but what you also had going on during the Seven Years' War were European powers fighting. And one of the one of the most influential wars is obviously the War of Spanish Succession, um, having a French ruler, this French duke. Um, he is Philip of Anjou. Having him give up those rights to the French throne is kind of a big deal. I'm just saying. All right. So the Enlightenment and the Old Order, part one. Enlightenment thinkers sought to apply the methods and questions of the scientific revolution to the study of human society. One way of doing this was to classify and systemize knowledge. And another way was to search for natural laws that were thought to underlie human affairs and devise scientific techniques of government and social regulation. One of the most famous people of the Enlightenment was John Locke, right here. And John Locke argued that governments were created to protect the people. And he emphasized the importance of individual rights, rights that the government cannot take away from you for whatever reason. And another ruler, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, a.k.a. J.J. Rousseau, as we call him, asserted that the will of the people was sacred. He believed the people would act collectively on the basis of a shared historical experience. 
at the time, this was incredibly radical. And because the Constitution of the U.S. is based off of what these two men discussed and what they believed in, we're like, well, duh. Of, of course that pe people have natural rights the government can't take away. Everyone knows that. Well, at the time, they were radicals. Not all enlightened rulers, though, were radicals or atheists. Somehow this, this gets linked together. Um, many people, especially Voltaire, believe that monarchs could be the agents of change. The monarchs themselves could believe this, and then you you would have a more peaceful transition to a constitutional monarchy versus all-out revolutions. Some members of the European nobility, such as Catherine the Great of Russia or Frederick the Great of Prussia, patronized Enlightenment thinkers. And they used these ideas as they reformed their bureaucracies, legal and tax systems, and even their own economies. But at the same time, these monarchs also suppressed and banned truly radical ideas that promoted republicanism or attacked religion however too many channels and means of communication remain open to permit any real or lasting suppression of ideas and just in case you missed that with me <gasps> sounding scandalized what they're really worried about is the idea that people will want full independence and people will stop believing in what the bible says and that was a little too radical for many of these monarchs. And there's Catherine and JJ. So let's talk about the Enlightenment and the Old Order, specifically focusing on everyone's favorite, Ben Franklin. Many of the major intellectuals of the Enlightenment communicated with each other and with political leaders. And women were instrumental in the dissemination of these ideas. And a couple of different ways they were involved, they purchased and discussed the writings of enlightened thinkers and discussed that within their women's circles. And in the case of wealthy Parisian women, they made their homes available for salons at which enlightened thinkers gathered. So when we went over the coffee trade, this was actually a, a really big part of how enlightened ideas spread is people would come together, rich or poor, because penny universities, they only call a cup of coffee, one cent, and you can sit and you can listen to these people talk and discuss, and then you can take what you've learned and go and share it. The new ideas of the Enlightenment were particularly attractive to the expanding middle class in Europe and in the Western Hemisphere. Many European intellectuals saw the Americas as a new, uncorrupted place in which material and social progress would come more quickly than in Europe. And Ben Franklin really came to symbolize the natural genius and vast potential of America. Franklin's success in business, his intellectual and scientific accomplishments, and his political career career offered proof that in America, where society was free of the chains of inherited privilege and nobility, genius could in fact thrive. And this is why Ben Franklin is on the $100 bill. However, not every intellectual embraced the Enlightenment. Some saw it as an assault on vital elements within society such as certain traditions, the community, and faith, aka a lot of these people were thought of as just being heretics. Folk cultures and the popular protest. Most people in Western society didn't share in the ideas of the Enlightenment. Common people remained loyal to cultural values grounded in the pre-industrial past. And these cultural values prescribed a set of traditionally accepted mutual rights and obligations that connected people to their rulers. When you're dependent on someone for your actual safety in an exchange, you give them labor, you give them wares, crops, and whatnot, it's a bit hard to leave that mindset when you've got that mutual dependent relationship. When 18th century monarchs tried to increase their authority and to centralize power by introducing more efficient systems of tax collection and public administration, the people regarded these changes as violations of a sacred custom and sometimes began expressing their outrage in rather violent protests. Such protests aim to restore custom and precedent, but not to actually achieve revolutionary change. Obviously, that's not going to work, though, when people engage in violent protest. You're not doing it to, you know, keep things 
or going back or keep it the way it is. You, generally, people do that for change, and that's how it was treated, and that's what the reaction was as people are doing this for change. Rationalist Enlightenment reformers also sparked popular opposition when they sought to replace popular festivals within rational, irrational civic rituals. Alliteration is not my friend today. Spontaneous popular uprisings had revolutionary potential only when they coincided with conflicts within the elite. So some famous folks you should know of the American Revolution, because that's where we're heading to next. You've got Joseph Brandt, Ben Franklin, Charles Cornwallis, the man who needs no introduction and no name. And this idea right here, this is what we call romanticism, guys. Washington crossing the Delaware. You might want to write that down, romanticism, um, which is artist an artistic movement that's really taking the everyday notion and making it more ideal it's making it seem really what it's not and let me tell you a little story washington first of all they're crossing the delaware at night just throwing that out there for you um but washington was not standing in the little tiny boat because if he did that a he could have fallen out b he could have tipped the boat over as the song goes don't rock the boat don't rock the boat baby rock the boat don't tip the boat over because that's probably what would have happened. And also, nobody's going to raise the American flag and hold it up super, super high because, A, nothing says, here I am, like waving a banner in the distance. Also, I can guarantee you everybody was probably competing on who got to row next. It's cold. It's dark. It's winter. You want to stay warm. But anyway, moving on. How did the war actually even start? Well, the British victory over the French in the Seven Years' War and the French and Indian War increased tensions between the British and North American colonists. British authorities decided that the colonists had to pay for their own defense, and more colonists complained and then tried to boycott British authorities. Well, this leads to more problems, because after the British victory, the government faced two problems in its North American colonies. A, the danger of war with the Amer Indians as colonists pushed west of the Appalachians, and the need to raise more taxes from the colonists to pay for the increasing costs of colonial administration and defense. The British attempted to impose new taxes or to prevent further westward settlement, and this provoked protests within the colonies. In the Great Lakes region, the British policies undermined the Amer Indian economy and provoked a series of Amer Indian raids on settled areas of Pennsylvania and Virginia. The American Indian Alliance that carried out these raids was defeated within a year, but fear of more violence led the British to establish a Western limit for settlement in the Proclamation of 1763, write that down, and to slow down settlement in the regions north of the Ohio and east of the Mississippi in the Quebec Act of 1774. You should know that too, just saying. The British government tried to raise new revenue from the American Indian colonies through a series of fiscal reforms and new taxes, including a number of new commercial regulations, such as the Stamp Act of 1765, as well as other taxes and duties that would continue. And in response to these actions, the colonists, who were quite accustomed to substantial political autonomy on fiscal matters, organized boycotts of British goods, they staged violent protests, and they attacked British officials. Now, guys, here's the thing I want you to remember. The colonists are accustomed to certain substantial political autonomy, especially when it comes to fiscal matters. And this is going to be a really big difference between North American colonies and when South American countries gain their independence from Spain and Portugal is the North American colonists had had experience in smaller governments, be they local town governments or uh, what would be the modern day states, some kind of economic system. The countries in South America were not permitted to do that at all by the European powers. And once they gain independence, they are going to have a lot of issues because they've never been able to do this. So that's, that's a huge huge difference relations would continue to worsen um between the american colonists and the british authorities because the boston massacre of 1770 killed five civilians and i know you guys might be thinking "Ooh, 
five people. That's that's not really a massacre. But at the time period, it was. You have to think about the kind of weapons that are involved, the number of people who were attending. It was a huge deal. You also had the issue of the British government granting the East India Company a monopoly on the import of tea to the colonies. When colonists in Boston responded to the monopoly by dumping tea into the Boston Harbor, the British actually closed the port of Boston and put administration of Boston in the hands of a general. So what we have over here, protests at the Stamp Act, the Boston Tea Party, and then who would ah, who would be a loyalist or perhaps even a tea merchant being tarred and feathered? So what we have here are territorial claims of the 13 colonies, as well as other British territory. So you guys already know this. You've seen it before. Um, you'll also notice some battles that are popping up, British and American victories. Mostly right along here. Very nice, very nice. All right. So moving along, the course of revolution. Colonial governing bodies dis disposed British governors and established a continental congress that put a currency and organized an army. Ideological support for independence was given by the rhetoric of thousands of street corner speakers. Um, also a very famous man, Thomas Paine, had a pamphlet called Common Sense, as well as the Declaration of Independence. Now I'm going to destroy the dream for you here. So we celebrate the 4th of July, Independence Day, because that's the day that the Declaration of Independence was signed. That is not actually correct. So the Declaration of Independence was signed between July 4th and August 2nd. We celebrate Independence Day on the 4th because that would be the day that John Hancock actually signed his signature. So it's really more of John Hancock Day. But it took quite a bit of time to convince everyone to sign it. It also took quite a bit of time to get everyone there to sign it. There's a really great book. I've got it if you want to read it. It is called Lies My Teacher Told Me. Check it out, guys. Busts all the awesome myths for you. Moving on. <clears throat> the British sent a military force to pacify the colonists. Now, here's the thing, guys. Britain did not want to go to war with the colonists for a couple of reasons. One, it was expensive. But two, the British soldiers themselves didn't want to partake because they still viewed the colonists as fellow Brits, even though they were not living in Great Britain. They still viewed them as fellow countrymen. How um, the, the war revolution starts out, the British forces won most of the battles, but it was unable to control the countryside, and the British were also unable to achieve a compromise um, of a political solution to the problem in the colonies. Amer Indians served as allies to both sides. The Mohawk leader, Joseph Brandt, led one of the most effective forces in support of the British. And when the war was over, he and his followers fled to Canada. France entered the war as an ally of the U.S. in 1778, and they gave crucial assistance to the American forces, including naval support that enabled Washington to defeat Cornwallis at Yorktown. And that was a huge battle, huge victory. Following this defeat, the British negotiators signed the Treaty of Paris, 1783, giving unconditional independence to the former colonies. After independence, each of the former colonies drafted written constitutions that were submitted to the voters for approval. The Articles of Confederation served as a constitution for the U.S. during and after the Revolutionary War. In May of 1787, a constitutional convention began to write a new constitution because, in all honesty, Articles of Confederation just wasn't working. And this established a system of government that was democratic, but it only gave the vote to a minority of adult males, and it also protected the institution of slavery. But this constitutional convention did set up the constitution, obviously, and it sets up what will become the government of the United States of America. Now, fun little story for you on George Washington. He did not actually want the job. He was looking forward to retirement. But when he was called upon, there was not actually an official vote or election of multiple people. George Washington seemed to be the only true candidate. And he was voted in by uh, the, the legislative body or what would be the legislative body. And the deal was four years. 
And then four years was up. And he was asked, you know, can, can you stay on? And he, and he did. Didn't want to. Just wanted to go retire at his country estate. And he storms out, and then he's like, you know what, I'm done. And this actually sets the precedent for the two terms. There would not be an amendment, though, that says a president could only sit for two terms until after FDR dies during his fourth term. But anyway, Washington sets the precedent. After his second term, he leaves. And within a year, he's dead. So enjoy your retirement, folks. All right, we're going to stop there for today. We'll pick up in our next podcast with the French Revolution. Moving on to the reign of terror and Napoleon and his massive defeat. Why you should never invade Russia in the dead of winter? We'll find out. So have a great night, guys. Cheers.